All right, here we are. We're in Matthew chapter 10. We're looking at verse 8. That's right. Thought I was going to actually do through 15. That's okay. The Lord has a lot to say in verse 8. And I'm excited to get into it with you. Uh, So, Father, as we get into your word, Lord, as uh, Michael has said, Father, it's a blessing to have uh, the opportunity to celebrate um, independence as a nation, recognizing that what that truly was was your sovereign hand and your sovereign plan. And, uh, Lord, we look back and see your goodness in it and what you've done through America, through the United States of America, over the last 200 years in this world, Lord, you have big plans. Your plans don't stop. And you know what you want to do with all the nations of the earth. Your plan is to perfect, purify, and sanctify every single nation on this planet, that there would no longer be the oppression of the poor and of the weak, that widows and orphans would rejoice under your reign and under your hand. And Lord, that day is coming. But to bring that day, we have to go through hard seasons and hard times. And uh, you said that, that there would be wars and rumors of wars, famines, pestilences in various places. And you said that uh, false teaching and false doctrines would go out into the world and there would be many false Christs. You also said, don't let your heart be troubled about this. These things must come to pass for the end draws near as we wait and we see your hand and your faithfulness. You are a faithful, loving God. You've never, ever abused one of your children. You always protect, deliver, and bring peace into your kids' lives. Even though this world is a harsh environment where sin reigns and Satan has his day, it is only for a short season. You will not let it go long, for you love your people, and you will not see your people perish, but you will deliver every single one who is yours. So Lord, we pray that today you would draw us in, that you would affirm our place in your kingdom, that you would work in our hearts, and that you would be glorified in this time that we have together as we study your word and grow together in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, Jesus is uh, at a big moment where he begins to... uh, hand off to the apostles the responsibility of the kingdom. He says to Peter, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom, right? What were the keys of the kingdom? The gospel. It was uh, when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It was on that statement that he built his church, that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. He's the savior of the world. And so that is our hope. That is where our foundation lies. And where true salvation takes place in the acceptance, in the belief that Jesus saves us from our sins through his death on the cross. And that when he rose again from the dead, he affirmed by the power and authority of God that our sins were truly forgiven and that we are made white in him. Oh man, that's a a glorious day. Oh, happy day. Uh, as we celebrate what Christ has done for us. Now, these disciples are preparing for this very thing. Jesus is preparing Israel as they are going to reject him and crucify him. There would be a solid remnant who would know the truth. And he is still raising up a remnant on the earth today. And that is the journey that you and I are on as we've stepped into faith in Jesus Christ. If you haven't, You need to stop looking at the water and dive in. You know what I'm saying? It's summertime. You guys know exactly what I'm saying. You go to the river, you get up on that rock. Oh, it's a little higher than I thought. Maybe I don't want to do this. How deep is that down there? Can somebody go down and tell me how deep that is before you jump in and you're like, how cold is the water? Is that water cold? I just have to jump in and find out. Well, you know, that's what walking with the Lord is is like. It's not like you can just slowly slide in that's not the examples we see in scripture uh you know uh they the children of israel had to be all in they they they, when they crossed the the jordan river the the priests of all people carrying the ark of the covenant had to step into the river 
And that's not just a nice little slope down shuffling your feet. That, that's an, the, the, banks, the, wa- the banks of the river were overflowing. It was a raging river. They had to step in. Okay, God, you're going to catch me? And you know, that's so much the journey that we're on is a journey of faith. And that's what we're going to zero in on today. Because the Lord is calling the disciples not just to speak about him, but to actually, on his behalf, transfer out his power, his saving power, into other people's lives. It's a huge, huge monumental leap forward. It's one thing to stand and watch in awe and see God work through someone's life. Well, especially Jesus himself. Can you imagine standing there watching him do these unspeakable miracles, these things that are beyond explanation. There's just no rational thinking that could, that could describe what just took place. When you see a lifelong cripple, someone who's never seen or never walked, uh, you know what that looks like. It's not like they've got two healthy-looking legs hanging off their body. They're atrophied. They're, they're twisted. They're gnarled. And suddenly come straight and walk. I mean, it'd be like crazy stuff like that. Well, now the Lord is calling them to do the same. And Matthew's recording this moment. Uh, Can you imagine being Matthew and remembering back at that moment, sitting there with the Lord when he says, all right, guys, it's your turn. What What do you mean it's our turn? Yeah, look at this in Matthew uh, chapter 10, verse 1. When he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Like, if they hadn't seen Jesus do it, you wouldn't have any idea how to do it. Like, what does that look like? Casting a demon out. You go down the guy's throat? You know? It's a good thing they saw Jesus do it. It was with the word of his power. He just spoke, and these demons had to obey. They were under the authority of the high king of heaven, the great commander of the Lord's army. They were subject. And so having seen these miracles, he's now calling them. And as we look at verse 8, it says to go out and, oh, let's review before, so we just get our heads on straight. We saw in verses 5 through 7, 5 through 7, a divine commission, a central objective, and a clear message. These were the things that Jesus has sent his disciples out into. A divine commission. It was not their idea. It was God's idea. God says, go. Oh, okay. Now it's time to obey. He says the central, the central objective. It's, don't go just anywhere. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's where the preparatory work has been done. That's where God has worked and moved amongst a people like no other on the earth. They have the scriptures. They have the knowledge that he is going to send their Messiah. Their Messiah is coming and they've been described. It's been described to them what he is to do, what he's to be like. And so they have this background. And so now God is saying, I want you to go specifically to tell them he is here. That's what the line, the kingdom of heaven is at hand means. The kingdom of heaven is manifested. It's tangible. It's touchable. It's here. You want to see him? That's right. The kingdom of heaven is a him. It is Jesus. He is the kingdom of heaven. He is the king. And without him, there can be no kingdom. And so the king is here and you can see him. And that was their message going out. Now, as you go, he says, I want you to go in my power. Verse 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. He begins to instruct his disciples, what's your focus? As you preach, now confirm your preaching. Your pedigree, your beyond your pedigree, Well, it is a pedigree. Think about it. Your salvation is a pedigree, for we are now the children of God. And as the children of God, we've been given the power of God to walk in, in faith. And so this is a powerful moment as he's imparting his power on them as a sign that they are truly his children, his representatives, his ambassadors, the ones that will 
represent the kingdom to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. There is an anointing and an empowering by God's Spirit to move and to act and to work amongst His people. And so they are being sent. And I want you to go and heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. That's how they'll know you're from me. Now I want you to think about uh, a, a clean slate, wide open. If you were to impress a group of people as being the Son of God, what would you do? What, what would be your calling card, if you will? How would you impress them? Would you pull off a Superman and just leap over tall buildings in a single bound? You know, would you, would you, uh, you know, do tricks and acrobatics beyond human reasoning? Would you wow them and impress them with your intellect, solving riddles and enigmas that could never be solved, just absolutely marveling the people with your intellect? What would you do? What strikes me interesting about this is what God has chosen the Messiah to be known as and to do is compassion. He's doing works of compassion, but not just any old compassion. He's having compassion on the effects of sin. For sin has brought disease and sickness into our world. The Bible teaches that clearly. And that through that, death has entered the world. That is the final decree against sin. And so the evidence that Jesus is who he is and that these disciples are following the one who is qualified, they are now given the power over the undoing of sin. And so when they speak and someone is healed, or they touch and someone is healed, this is God undoing the effects of sin in the world, if not that person's particular life. How many times did Jesus say to somebody, go and sin no more? Or uh, your sins are forgiven you. Remember the man with the, uh, the paralytic man who was, who was crippled? He said, your sins are forgiven you. And of course, the Pharisees are... No one has the right to forgive sins. No one but God. And he, knowing their thoughts, spoke directly and said, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you or rise up and walk? Don't you get it? They're connected? That you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He turns to the man and he says, rise up and walk. Now, the apostles are carrying this message, the message of the gospel, the reality that the king, the Messiah, is present with them. He's giving them the power to forgive sins through the cross of Jesus Christ. It's coming. And in foreshadow of it, to heal. To undo the curse which, which has bound up somebody in their life. The undoing of the curse. How exciting is that? Now, now I have to be honest, it's intimidating. I've, I, I've spent years scared to death of it. When I've seen God really move and work through my life, I have been terrified. Like, Lord, this is too much. This is too big. Because we spend so much of our lives in this natural body. All of it. <laughs> we spend all of it in this natural body. And the weakness of this body, I'm well aware of. I have been well acquainted with it many times. It's not getting stronger. It's, it's aging. And so with that knowledge, there's, there's this intimidation. You know what's humanly possible and what's, in, what's absolutely inhuman, what's beyond our capability. And to operate in that realm is terrifying. But it's the life of faith that God is calling to us. Because think about it, sitting there as one of his apostles, it's like you're in this safe little environment with the one who's done it a thousand times. And you've never done it before. And he says, okay, I want you to go out and do it. Okay, um, could you hold my hand while I do? Actually, no, you're going alone. I'm sending you out two by two. That's what Mark's gospel tells us. And I want you guys to go and heal the sick. okay, that's a step of faith. I'm going to say be healed and wait to see if something happens. If not, I'll run away, totally embarrassed. <laughs> Forget you ever knew me. <laughs> but what a powerful moment because that's the, that's the faith that God has us to walk in. Go in the power of God. And I think this is something we really need to massage and drive home is, 
is you are no different. You're no different. You were saved by a miracle. Your heart was changed by a miracle. God opened you up and, and did heart surgery on you to have the conviction of sin, to have a desire for him. You know, the Bible says that no one seeks after God. No, not one. Do you think God was joking when he said that? then why are there people in this room today? Why are churches around the world got people in them? It's because the Holy Spirit is miraculously working in hearts and lives. It's an absolute miracle that we know God and that we know He loves us. That, that we know that He gave His Son to die for us. To, to believe that to, from, the, the, from the depths of our soul is a revelation from God. It's beyond human reasoning. And we have to be reminded that we serve the Lord through His power, not our own. It is not in the wisdom of man, but in the wisdom and power of God that we serve. It's not in crafty words. It's not in learning how. I mean, there are so many agencies out there that advertise constantly to churches. We will triple your church's size and your church's finances. Just use us. Come on, call us in. And you know, the sad thing is, and the truth about every single one of them is it's all man's methods in how to manipulate and how to uh, uh, use people's good nature, the spirit of God wooing them into the kingdom to turn their, their desire and their zeal towards you and towards just growing your little kingdom big. Oh my goodness, it's sick. It embarrasses me. It embarrasses me. It embarrasses me that even a little bit of that nature dwells in me. That's embarrassing. It's like, oh God, deliver us all from such craftiness. You've got to watch out for this because it's so in our nature to do it, to depend on our own strength, our own limitations, our own abilities. You remember when God called Moses? Moses' response was, you know, I can't speak. I can't speak. I, I'm not your guy. Public speaking is not my thing. And I, I relate to Moses a whole bunch. God called me to the ministry before I could read at the age of 21. <laughs> I'm not joking, you know? I, I had a fourth grade reading level. When I began teaching, it was like reading a spelling list. Because he was like, was that a sentence or a spelling list? Because you know how... The words were so spaced out. It was like, had to remember that last word that I said a few minutes ago <laughs> as I'm working on sounding out the next one. I would have the kids. I was uh, in the youth group. I'd have the kids read, and then I would talk. <laughs> and, and it's like, I so related to Moses. Like, man, Lord, seriously, you're calling a dyslexic into the ministry? I, when I went to my entrance exams, uh, in um, after high school for junior college, I took the tests. They recommend what you take as classes, and they seriously, with a straight face, looked across the table and said to me, we recommend that you take English as a second language. <laughs> that was a low mo moment for me. I was like, what's my first language? <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, it's, it's jokes on you, right? <laughs> it's, like the, it's in the power of God. That's what I, had to, I, I had to know that immediately. If this is going to go anywhere, if God's going to do anything through my life as a pastor, it better be in His power. Because I don't have it. I know, I'm well acquainted with me. When, the, we, we <laughs> when we took our, um, what, it's not SATs, but the... Uh, the yeah, it's the stuff you take as, I think, a sophomore or a junior, you know. And, and in a class of 500, in a class of 500 students, I was all alone. <laughs> Sitting in an auditorium that was full when we started, and I was still working on my questions. Everyone else was gone. I mean, not kidding. I remember when the last student got up and walked. Well, there they go. Okay, it's just me and the curator or whatever they call me. I'm just filling in the dots. My goodness. 
And God calls us to serve and to minister. And, and, and I'll tell you, I have found it to be the greatest strength of my ministry. That's why I boast in it. It's the greatest strength of my ministry. Because there's just no room to, to, to depend on my intellect. There's just no room to do that. It's got to be God. And brothers and sisters, it's no different for you. You have not been called to the ministry and service of our Lord Jesus Christ to use your fleshly skills and attributes and to lean on them. No way. It's not in the glory of man. It's in the glory of God. He wants us to depend and lean on him. Isaiah 35, verse 5 and 6, the sign of the Messiah's coming was this. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be uh, unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. And you know, I love, that's how it began. We're going to see the physical springing forth of the deserts of this world when Jesus returns. That's a promise. He's going to bring back to life a planet that has been killed by the sin of humanity. It's going to be far worse when he comes back than it is today. But when he does, he's going to spring it forth. But you know, going back to his first coming, that's where he began his ministry, was in the desert and in the wilderness. That's where he was baptized and the heavens were opened and the Spirit of God came upon him in the form of a dove. And the Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's where the ministry began, this prophecy, the Messiah. He shall come forth. And when he does, he will open the eyes of the blind. He will unstop the ears of the deaf. He, deaf. he will cause the lame to leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb will sing oh how beautiful how beautiful dumb is when you can't speak yeah isn't that dumb double meaning a lot of our words have double meaning that's why we have so much fun with puns matthew chapter 11 verse 4 Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you have heard and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. You see, John had become discouraged as he sat in prison. The Messiah is supposed to raise the dead. He's supposed to set the captives free. And I'm in prison. What's up? What he didn't understand was before he could do that work, that spiritual work in hearts, he had to redeem through his death and resurrection on the cross. He had to first give his life. John thought he was first in line for the, the, the benefits of the kingdom of God. And in a way he was. But it wasn't to be starting on this earth for him. He was going to see it when Jesus came with the victory of the cross and declared it in Abraham's bosom, oh, John the Baptist was there. And ah, now I get it. But in that moment, he thought, why is the best man of the bridegroom sitting in prison? Are you the one or should we expect another? He sent two disciples to ask Jesus. This was Jesus' response. You tell John. You tell him the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. In this was the prophecy that the Messiah would come. Not in glamorous tricks and flares. Like remember when Satan took Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and said, jump off. For the Bible says that he shall give his angels charge over you lest you dash your foot against a stone. And what is Jesus' response? You shall not tempt the Lord your God, but him only. Well, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. The next one's him only you shall worship and serve. So, uh, so Jesus was responding to Satan's temptation by, I'm not here 
to glorify myself or serve myself. Remember the first temptation. Turn the stones into bread. You're hungry. Turn the stones into bread. Feed yourself. I'm not here to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom. It was the opposite of what was expected by the Jewish people. It was the opposite of what this world looks for. And that's why John was even confused sitting there in prison. What is going on? Hey, I'm here to serve you, not myself. I'm here to save you, not myself. For if I save myself, I cannot save you. So he laid down his life for you and I. That is the power of what was happening. So these signs and wonders were sent to confirm the word. And so 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Paul says, Truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. God gave these apostles a special anointing that, that supersedes or exceeds anything that we've ever seen in church history. And, and I, I mean, looking back at church history, we can affirm this. These guys had giftings of healings and miracles that are far beyond any healer or miracle worker ever since that we've seen. They, they were just uh, being able to heal, but not to the level of Jesus. Jesus was like, healed every person he came in contact with. And the apostles, they did those healings as signs in specific moments, but not always. You know, Paul didn't do any miracles in Athens. But the Spirit was moving so mightily through Paul in Ephesus that if they took his sweatband from doing his job tent making, literally, that's the tent making job was tent making, he, he, as he was working, they would take his sweatbands and go touch someone who was sick or someone diseased or demon possessed and they would be healed. And, and that, that wasn't in every city. That wasn't always. In, was it Lystra? The Apostle Paul causes a man to, to stand up for the first time, to, to walk. Everybody knew this guy. They thought, well, he must be one of the Greek gods. They thought Barnabas, the quiet one, must be Zeus, and the one who talks a lot, Paul, must be Mercury. And they wanted to worship him. And he's like, no, 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 we're people just like you. But I'm here to tell you about God, I'm here to tell you about Jesus, his son, who died for your sins, forgave you. And they resisted the message. After seeing a lame man healed, they still stoned Paul. Drug his body outside the city and threw it in the refuse. The trash heap, he's a dead body, let's get rid of it. When the church gathered around him, brokenhearted, the Lord raised him up. It's pretty powerful. And so he talks about God's supernatural hand on his ministry and on his life. And that's what God wants us to rely on when relating the gospel. What does Paul write in Romans? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all those who believe. And I, 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 I've shared this message, the gospel message, with so many people at so many different times, but I'll never forget the first time in my adult life, after going to public high school and after knowing what is taught in that school and what most people believe in evolution and all that and in humanism, when I talked to a guy who had never been to the church, never heard the gospel, I started telling him and I started in Genesis and I started talking about Adam and Eve in the garden and Satan was so in my ear whispering, this is a fairy tale. You are telling this guy a fairy tale. And he's looking at me like, you are telling me a fairy tale. And it was so overwhelming and discouraging. I felt ashamed. I felt ashamed in that moment. Though I still believed, I still believed I felt ashamed. But as I've grown in, in my walk with the Lord, I've become more and more emboldened, knowing this is absolutely the truth. The best explanation for our existence is God. And the best explanation for the mess up in this world is our sin. And how did it get here? The Bible clearly declares it. That God gave us a choice of obedience or disobedience. Obedience in eating the garden, the fruit of the trees of the garden, and the tree of life of disobedience in going for that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
and eating that fruit. And Satan tempted Adam and Eve and brought them right in. And ever since, sin has corrupted this planet through mankind. And not only the planet, but the universe. It's pretty powerful. And you think, what a, what a crazy, crazy superstitious thing to believe. Not when you have God in view. You can't even explain your existence. And yet the word of God clearly says how you got here. And it's so powerful. It's so revealing. It's so right. And when I think about what you have to believe to not believe in God, your only other alternative is random chances, just pure chance that all this creation was made. And the word creation can't even be coined or phrased without a creator. And so when, when you hear somebody spouting, yes, this creation is millions and millions of years old, well, you're defying the living God in his wisdom and in his attributes. And, and, and it's like, well, pfft, it looks like it's millions of years old. Well, there's a lot of evidence it's not. If the sun is millions of years old, then the earth won't exist for the loss of the sun's mass is measured every year. Did you know that? If you reverse that process, 100,000 years ago, the, the sun was touching the earth or at least less than a million. I gotta make sure I get my numbers right. But the, the, the sun was touching the earth. Just, just, just a very short million years ago, they say the earth is four million years old. Or I think it's now four billion. It ages really fast. <laughs> but it's lunacy when you think about the moon. The moon is moving away from the earth. That means the moon was attached to the earth just a few years ago. It's moving a few inches every 10 months. Did you know that? A few inches every 10 months. If the, earth, if the moon was any closer to the earth, the tides would have been ginormous. No life could live. There would be a tidal wave constantly whooshing around the planet. That's what killed the dinosaurs. Not really. Dinosaurs aren't that old. There's evidence they're not that old. Did you know that? They, they cut open a T-Rex's thigh bone for the first time in 2005. They were too precious to, to damage. They, they would put them in museums. They finally had enough of them. They said, hey, let's cut one open. When they cut the T-Rex's thigh bone open, the bone marrow was still perfect and intact, and they took DNA samples and ran its DNA and found it to be 60% different than anything on the planet or 40%. It's 60% the same, 40% different. Its closest relation is a chicken. <laughs> but it's so far off. I mean, when you think about this stuff, when, when, when you have a geneticist, and I've heard them talk about the sensitivity of your DNA, if you just change 0.5%, you will be so handicapped. If you change 1% of your DNA, you're dead. You're dead. You won't live. Just 1%. Chimpanzees, 2% different, and we came from them. How? Yeah, monkeys and chimpanzees. They want to say that that's our closest relative. Well, they're so far off in the genetic world, we could never even survive the surgery. It's, it's impossible. It's, you know, the faith it takes to believe this stuff. It's not scientific. Because what we observe is exactly what Genesis 1 declares. God created order. He created everything in its own kind. And there is a, a consistency in that. You cannot have a rabbit and a monkey mate and make some kind of weird creature. It's not going to happen. It won't survive. We see how genetics is so, so refinedly tuned and tied to its type. And yes, there's adaptation and change, but it's built into the system. It's still the same system, but it's built in. And oh, I tell you, we could go all day on that stuff, right? Not that I'm so smart, but it's really not that hard. It's really not that hard to see. There has to be a creator. It's incredible. You know, the one that really gets me, I remember being stumped by this in a 
junior high was the, what came first, the chicken or the egg? And we all sat around pondering, what came first, the chicken or the egg? No, two chickens. <laughs> Do I need to explain the birds and the bees to you? If you don't have a rooster and a hen, you don't have chickens. They are not self-reproducting. <laughs> there has to be two chickens. So that means you have to have a rooster and a hen evolve at the same time and in the same location. If one evolves in France and the other one in Germany, no chickens! <laughs> That's how finely tuned this is. And we ignore that. I mean, I remember just under the conviction of, of watching my son be born, it was the most amazing thing. It was like, that came from sex. That's incredible. This little head came popping out. Hair already on. He was a hairy dude. Came out of the womb. Oh my goodness. You know, in that moment, I got upset with every evolution believing person. Like, Seriously? You watch this happen? How could there be a nurse, a pre, or a, you know, a prenatal nurse or whatever they're, they're called there in the birthing room, giving, overseeing birth after birth and not be convinced that there's a creator? I mean, it's just too mind-boggling. The complexity of that little guy coming out, breathing in moments, eating immediately, and yet needing its, his hand held for the next, well, the next 20 years. <laughs> it's true. Just warning you younger people. <laughs> it takes time <laughs> to raise them. It's so God. It is so God. Signs and wonders. <laughs> Look at this, what 1 Corinthians 2 says. My speech and my preaching were not with the persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. It's the power of God that we bring the gospel forth. And when we look at it, when we look at just the bottom, the bottom line of beliefs, what is most rational is that there is a God. And what is most rational is if I can ration, then truly God can rationalize. And if I can communicate, then truly God can communicate. And if I can process and think, and if I can hear and I can see, then surely God can do all these things. Why would we make our God less than we are? That's foolishness. Cause and effect. The cause must be greater, equal to, or greater than the effect. And so if we have a creation, then our creator is greater. And he operates in the power of God. We are to operate in the power of God for the gospel. It is God who convinces. It is God who brings forth. Now, I used to think it always has to be done through some sign or wonder. But when you read through the, uh, through the book of Acts, you start to realize, wait a minute, Paul was stoned after doing a sign. It didn't convince him. Moses didn't convince Pharaoh until Pharaoh was hit personally by losing his firstborn son. That was when it finally broke through and sank in. And so, <clears throat> so too, you and I, we must be convinced by the power of God. If we're convinced by the wisdom of man, then we will lose that conviction with the next great thought that comes along, every wind of doctrine that passes, we keep getting drawn away. Once you've been established by the power of God, there's no being moved. There's no being moved. You know that you know. He has, his spirit bears with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so, oh, brothers and sisters, operate. Go in the power of God. When you minister, when you serve the Lord, Lean in on him in his strength, not your own, in your own reasoning, in your own powers. Let him be God. Now, the second part of this that we're going to touch on today is in verse 8. What does it say here at the bottom of verse 8? 
Freely you have received, freely give. Freely you have received, freely give. What did the disciples pay to receive this power to do these miracles? Nothing. All that they had received by, uh, from the Lord was just straight from the Lord. It was just a gift. He says, therefore, I want you to go out and give this power, use this power without charge. I want it to be free. I want you to just to, to serve the Lord without charge. This is so important. This is what God is calling us to do. And this is an earmark of a good servant of the Lord. The good servant of the Lord serves the Lord without charge. I get red flags galore when you invite someone to come speak and you can't afford them. You know what I'm saying? Like, whoa, just to come talk to us, you need that. God is calling us as ministers to live in the power of God, not in the reason of man. We aren't a business. If we are a business, this is a very pathetic business. <laughs> you weren't charged at the door. Nobody's shoving anything in your face, I hope not. Or forcing or controlling you to give. You are called to give out of your free will to the Lord from your heart. We'll talk about that next week as we get into the miraculous provision of God in the minister's life. That's part of it. But I don't serve you directly. I serve you indirectly. I serve the Lord directly. And I serve you indirectly. That's why you're not in charge of me. You're not in charge of the staff here. We are all accountable and responding to God. God is who leads and directs us. And if you feel we are not being led or directed by God, then what are you doing here? You ought to get, get, be, get out before while you can. You know, we have to be under the conviction that God is doing this work and that it is his work. And I don't want to tamper. I don't want to mess. I don't want to get in the way of that. And so the exhortation that Jesus is giving his apostles is the earmark of the minister is the finances is not your focus. What did he say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So it's secondary. It's secondary. Yes, God knows, right? Jesus said it himself. God knows the things that you have need of. This is for all of us. And so for me, as a pastor, to put my focus on you and what you give is to take my focus off of God and what God does in us and how he provides for us. And it is amazing to see God's provision in my life. It has been a joy and it has been terrifying all at the same time. You know what I'm saying? Um, let's read some scriptures before I go into just telling stories. Okay, false ministers. Here's the earmark of false ministers. Things to watch out for. There's a lot of them. There's more of these than, uh, than the good ones around, just being honest. Here it is. Acts chapter 8. When the disciples went to Samaria, Philip specifically was a, um, a deacon in the church, one of the seven, went down to Samaria to share the gospel, and the Samaritans received the gospel with joy. And he came back and shared the news, and the, the apostles, in prayer, sent Peter and John down to baptize them in the Holy Spirit. And so Peter and John went down and were baptizing these people in the Holy Spirit. It was a revival. There was this incredible work happening and this Simon the sorcerer sees this happening, and he was a well-known sorcerer, that is, a, a kind of like the witch doctor kind of person. He was a bit of a magician. They would actually buy their tricks from each other. When one had a good trick, like a magician, you'd say, I'll give you $100,000 to teach me that trick. All right. And that was a common practice, so that you would uh, make money on your tricks that you came up with, and you would use money to buy the others. But in the meantime, you would just trick everyone into supporting you. It was a, 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 this, this uh, you know, work to get people to follow after you, to, 
to think you're some great person. And he was considered a great man. When he saw the baptism of the Holy Spirit, verse 18, when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. He perceived that his heart was evil, and that he just he wanted the, 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 the fireworks show of this gift so that he could attract people to himself and charge them. And you know, you see it. How much would you pay to have your son or daughter healed, delivered, set free? How much would you pay? Anything and everything. How much would you pay to be delivered? Anything and everything. And then charlatans take advantage of this. They say, great. You could have my prayer cloth for $119.95 a month for 12 months. I will send you my prayer cloth that I have sweated over, wept over, and prayed over, and you can lay this on your ailment, and you will be whole. Send in, send in, and people do it. They're desperate. I'll do anything to be better. I'll do anything to have my son or my daughter back and okay. This is exactly what Jesus is preaching against. You, as a servant of the Lord, do not do this. Remember when Naaman was healed in the Old Testament, he desired to give Elisha money. He brought great wealth. I mean, a ton of wealth. More than Elisha ever saw in his entire life, for sure. And he wanted to give it to him for healing him of his leprosy. He said, no, it's a free gift of God. Well, Gehazi didn't think so. He wanted a piece of that pie, and he thought up a story and tricked uh, Naaman into giving him some of that money. And Elisha cursed Gehazi with the very leprosy that Naaman was healed from. From generation after generation, your family will have this leprosy. Wow. You see how serious God is about this? This is serious. Look at what Isaiah 56 says about these types of people. Verse 11, Yes, they are greedy dogs, which never have enough. And they are shepherds who cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his own gain from his own territory. Wow, that, that just really, really speaks truth, doesn't it? When you see false teachers, they're all about their kingdom. Watch out. When it's about their territory, oh man, I've seen pastors be territorial. No, you can't plant a church near me. No, you can't have a Bible study there. No, no, and no, you can't go to other churches. You belong here. You're a member here. You're stuck with this pastor and pastor. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Read that again. They're very territorial. Now they guise it with being a good shepherd. I don't want you deceived. I don't want you out there amongst the wolves. Wait a minute. You're not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit led you through these doors. And I pray that it's the Holy Spirit that leads you out of these doors. And that it's not you following your flesh or your own desires. That it is the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit alone that guides and leads your life. And that's what we're here to learn and do and to grow in. But I'll tell you what, watch out for those who get territorial. It's not of God. Now I see the war in the flesh. I can absolutely see that kind of battle. If I tell everybody that they're free to go anywhere they want, they'll never come back here. I guarantee there's 10 pastors that preach twice as good as me right here in this vicinity. I could probably take a string, hold it, and you could walk around and go, yep, got 10 of them. You know what I mean? So it's like, oh, just stay right here. Don't, don't go to anywhere else. They get, they get schizo about it. And it's wrong. It's wrong. It's the flesh. And you've got to fight against the flesh and watch out for that. Uh, they're, they're, they're for their own gain rather than your gain. It's about their gain. Yeah. Support me. Bless me. And they don't say it that way. You would leave. 
they have to fancy and flower up the words. But you'll notice that Sunday after Sunday, it's about money. What are you spending your money on? Why isn't it here in our coffers? Now coffer it up. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's really wrong. And I, and I say it with a sad heart that there's so many that have fallen to it. They're trying to do the work of the ministry through the flesh. They're trying to do it in their own strength. Now, to, to get personal, we've been tested on this dozens of times. And we continue to be tested on it. And it's of the Lord that we're tested on it. And I appreciate the test. It reveals the heart. And it's a wonderful thing to be tested and pass. Well, in 2013, we went out full time uh, to, to be at the church. We started the church in 2009. I worked for Nevada Irrigation District uh, full time to supply the needs of the family. And then we, we would on the weekends minister here and on Wednesday nights. We just started going, okay? Well, the Lord led me by the picture on the wall that's in the back where the, where the um, ladies are doing the sound there. That picture right there, somebody gave me as a gift. And I looked at that picture, and as I looked at it, it's a picture of Jesus walking on the water, but you're looking at his back. The Lord spoke to my heart, and he said, follow me. And I thought about that. I pondered on that, and I came to the conclusion, the Lord wants me to go out full time. And then he gave me a verse in uh, Timothy that you're to give yourself entirely over to the service of the ministry. And so with these convictions, I set forth to pray about it, went to the board, said, I feel like God's calling me out full time. Now, the God did not call the church to tell me to go out full time. He called me to go out full time. He did not call the church to supply my needs and to support me full time. That, that was up to God how he does that. That's, that's up to him. Now, we're going to balance this next week because there is a call there that you need to know. But I'm not worried about whether you're obedient or not. I mean, yes, for your well-being, I pray for it. But not for my advantage or for the advantage of this church. We're, we're a drop in the bucket in the kingdom of God, okay? But God led me to step out full time. And so that meant not pressuring the people, not badgering the people, not hounding the people just teach the word. I gave five months notice so that I could train the next guy to take my job. I stepped out. When I gave five months notice, there was about 70-ish people in the church. Five months later, there was 40. And I was like, God, I'm stepping out into nothing. Literally. I have no idea what you're going to do. And we were terrified. And for the first weeks, we were really terrified because it wasn't there. Like, this is insane. Like, did I miss here? Lord, where you guide, you provide. What are you doing? We sat quiet on that, and after a couple months, somebody dropped $100,000 in the offering. God bless them. But I'll tell you, that happened once in the history of this church. That's not a common occurrence, okay? That never happened in my dad's ministry of 42 years. Nobody ever dropped that much money in the offering. It was absolutely shocking. And we were able to have the church run for a whole year. It supplied the salary. It supplied, um, we, we remodeled this room and made it bigger. And we um, took on more classrooms. We also went to Haiti three times. At the end of that year, that money was used up. And it was no longer there. Here's the test. Do you change your protocol? You're now full-time. You're now depending on what is in the church finances for your livelihood. Do you change your story? Oh, that was a tough one. But I had such a deep conviction from God. It's you, Lord, who supplies my needs. It's you, Lord. So we kept our mouth shut. We said nothing. We met with the board. The board sees the finances. They're like, sorry, dude. <laughs> they weren't laughing. They were hurting with us. And... We just were like, Lord, what is it? What do you want us to do? What am I doing wrong? In the middle of that wondering, a brother who, who uh, came to the church from Nevada Irrigation District, he, I actually had the privilege of leading him to Christ when I was there before I went out uh, from, before I left the job. And he was coming Saturday nights and he goes, Josh, I don't know, but I feel like you're supposed to go back to NID. 
And it was a conversation that I had been having with the Lord was, Lord, if you want me to go back to secular work, then why did you ever take me out of NID in the first place? It was a great job. I loved that job. Now I'm going to have to go and be a bus boy or, you know, something. I got to do something. I didn't know what I was going to do, where I was going to fit. And, and so for him to come forward and say this, I felt like it was a word from the Lord. And I kind of first resisted it. It was like, what? I, I'm not supposed to go backwards. I'm supposed to move forward. And I fought it in my heart. But you can't argue when God does, I mean, I'm not kidding you, during that season as we were crying out to the Lord and praying, after we would pay the bills here, there was a Sunday that there wasn't even two dimes to rub together afterwards. Like I couldn't even take a little bit of money. It was like, no. And we were three months behind in our mortgage. And I was like, Lord, what are we going to do? They, they were calling. It was a season when they were ready to take homes because the, the, the market was getting hotter again. And we're about to lose our house. The Lord popped into my head, our CalPERS. I forgot about it. CalPERS, I cashed it in, paid for off the mortgage, got a little more time, and went and applied at NID. And the Lord got me back in, and he gave me a raise. And, and he gave me a promotion. And the manager, when I left, said, you will never come back here. You will never work here again. And I said, okay. I didn't say yeah, and I was like, okay. <laughs> there I was after a year and a half back as a senior operator at NID. It was amazing how the Lord just worked that all together. Then the, immediately the church turned around. Once I was back there, the Lord just confirms his work. The church turned around, started growing again. The finances started growing, but I knew I was where I was supposed to be. He called us back out in 2020. You know what he told me? Because I was freaking out. Like, oh, I don't want to do this again, Lord. He said, it will be different this time. And you know, it is amazing that the Lord not only hired us back, he four other staff members, five full-time staff members at our church, all at the same time. It was in the same year, within months of each other. The Lord did that. I'm telling you, it's God. And he'll test you. I'm telling you, he will test you. That's why I'm telling you this story because you will personally be tested in your faith and in your walk with the Lord over and over again. And will you cave in your convictions? Will you change the rules to conveniently operate with what you're most comfortable with? Because well, maybe it's not so bad to let the people know how tight we are. Maybe it's not so bad to let the people know that uh, you know, we're hurting and it, it could benefit them. That's how Satan, in my mind, okay, I'm not, I, I, I'm not preaching at every preacher that's, that gives an altar, you know, like a, a, a call to the people is in sin. I'm not saying that. That's what God has for me as a pastor. And so walking in that, it would be wrong for me to say, guys, you got to dig down and dig deep because uh, your pastor's hurting. Oh, we're hurting here at the church. We're not going to be here anymore. You know what? If that's the case, then let God take it away. I mean that. God's in charge. He has, owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And what I've seen over the years, it's, it, I thought that my, my relationship would be so close to the people in the church, and it is, but not nearly as close as the Lord. I didn't realize how close I would be to the Lord in this. Because what I've watched over the years is God supernaturally provide and God supernaturally direct without, without human intervention. It's like amazing to watch how God stays ahead of us and he just keeps providing. And when he wants us to cut back, we cut back. You got to operate within the black. Don't go into debt. And so this has been a faith journey. And we're on this journey now, even going, Lord, do we get a building? Do we move forward? Do we try to find a bigger place? If the Lord wants it, he'll do it. That may sound lazy, but I don't think so. I think that's faithful. He's provided for us here. We're faithfully serving here. We're going to keep faithfully serving here until the Lord changes the direction. And he will. I have all the faith in the world. And so I'm taking you into overtime with that story. Um, I've got a few verses to share with you as we close out. Let's look at true ministers. This is the heart of true ministers of God. 1 Peter 5, 2, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, 
not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Oh, so good. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. A bishop or a pastor must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money. You know, nobody's perfect in these lists. Nobody's perfect. I, I cannot say I've never failed at any one of these. No, I've failed in each one of them, but what this is for me is this is the stay on track list. Lord, my heart's wandering in this area. Keep me on track. Help me repent. Keep me back. Get, get me right. And you just got to stay on track. And that's for you too. Lord, help us in these things as you send us out in your power, not in our own power, for it is the power of God that saves. Lord, as you send us out, that we would give freely as we have freely received, freely give. That we would not have a, uh, an ambitious heart for money, but an ambitious heart for the kingdom of God, for the growth of, of souls to be saved, and for the growth of hearts to be established in the faith and encouraged in their walk with you. Lord, you are a faithful God, a great God, a good God, and we love you and we praise you and we thank you for all that you do in our lives. Thank you for the things that, Lord, look like they're going to be bad, but end up being good for us. Because you are a faithful God, and all things work together for good, for those who love you and are the called according to your purpose. So the things that we're facing today, you are in charge of. Help us, Lord, to trust you in them. In Jesus' name, amen.